Okay. Right. Now we can stop. Got it. There you go. All right. So yeah. So so yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about partly this sort of new package, which isn't really, it's still sort of in stages of development. Um, so it's not really completely uh, you know, it's not a 1.0 yet, and it's it's sort of pretty rough around the edges still and still being changed. Um, but uh, you know, I think people can start uh, working with it or or contributing to it. And um, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit. First, I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of methods, kind of give a tutorial of sort of what sort of the mindset is behind this package uh, or set of packages. Uh, so I'll do a little bit of sort of uh, like a tutorial. We'll do a little bit of whiteboard, and then we'll we'll sort of do like a um, a demo of of some of the uh, the package features. Um, right. So so basically, what I'm talking about in terms of what optimal control is. Is basically like you know in your situation you have like Rydberg atoms, so I'm talking about like how to shape the laser pulses. Uh, so if you have like a two photon transition here with a you know the 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 uh, blue laser and the red laser, how to shape these laser pulses to drive some kind of entangling dynamics. Let's say so if you pick two, you know like what should the laser pulses be in the um you know to to generate like a two qubit gate or similarly and this is actually the example uh, that I'll I'll be using in the paper that I'll I'll talk about in a little while. Um, very similarly, if you have, you know, superconducting qubits, uh, you have these transmon qubits, which are sort of, you know, anharmonic multi-level systems, um, and uh, you can drive them um, via a shared transmission line where you have a microwave pulse uh, that you sort of put in here, and it will sort of indirectly drive uh, each of these, these two anharmonic oscillators. Uh, and then there's like a, a static coupling between them through this transmission line, and in this way, you can, you can also generate entangling gate. Um, so, so basically, so the, the common feature is, is uh, for all of these control tasks and even other things like, you know, like transport problems, there's, there's, you know, a million other uh, kinds of, of control problems um, that you, you might want to solve with this sort of thing. And um, so, so the common thing is that you have a bunch of states. Uh, and specifically, if you're looking at two qubit states, so we're looking at the, the two qubit basis, right? So this is the states that we're looking at, like how they act dynamically. Um, and then you have a, a Hamiltonian uh, with uh, that contains some control fields, so like the you know the laser the laser amplitudes. Uh, so that's something that's in your Hamiltonian. And I'm assuming you can do uh, you can simulate the system uh, numerically. So you do some kind of time propagation. And mostly I'm, I'll be talking about piecewise constant, uh, not necessarily. So I'll get into what happens if it's not piecewise constant, uh, but sort of for simplicity. Uh, and also because the optimization methods that I'll mainly be talking about are kind of inherently piecewise constant, I'm sort of assuming that the control parameters in the end are sort of, uh, you know, real values epsilon and ln, where L is sort of the, the different control. So if you have like, you know, the two lasers or like, uh, you know, like a real part and imaginary part or something like that. Uh, so that's L. And then uh, you have for each time size N, you have a different value, right? Um, all right, so this is basically what we call like you know pulse level control in sort of the the uh, terminology of like IBM or or you know other people. Um, well, and then sort of from a numerical perspective, uh, we just up we just minimize a functional, right? So you have a functional that depends on the the control field amplitudes, uh, and it's going to have parts uh, like a final time functional that depends on the result of taking these states and propagating them forward in time. And then you you know you calculate like a square modulus or something, and then you might also have some running costs. So there could be running costs over the uh, the fields, like if you want to you know constrain the field in some way, or you could also have running costs over the propagated state. So if you have like some kind of forbidden subspace or something like that, if you want to minimize population there, there would be like a running cost on the states. Well, and then the sort of the most straightforward thing um, to do in terms of optimization is to take this functional and then you calculate the derivative of the functional with respect to all of the the control field values so that's you know the gradient of the of the functional and then you feed that into some kind of um optimization package like lbfgs so which is just you know second order or quasi second order uh gradient descent um, but you know you can feed it into what any optimizer you want um, right, so that's so the question is sort of how to do that efficiently. Um, so, so I'm, my ba my background is kind of in Fortran, so you know I, the, the the mindset is sort of that you want to do this for large Hilbert spaces, um, open quantum systems, so things where it, it kind of matters uh, what the the numerical efficiency is. Um, so the first thing, sort of the most important lesson, probably is to get your data structures right. Um, so this is not so much for 
traditional quantum computing, but but for like other systems where you have, let's say like molecular dynamics or like photo association or things like that, um, you have like, you know, wave packets that move on a grid. So in that case, you want to use a grid representation uh, where you do like a Fourier transform between, you know, coordinate and momentum representation. Where, but, but generally speaking, uh, you really want to sort of exploit sparsity in your system. And, you know, that's basically also what you're doing in a sense when uh, you use your Rydberg blockade uh, sort of reduction of the Hilbert space. Uh, so you want to, you know, you want to do that as efficiently as possible and sort of make sure that your, your operators are sparse, that your vectors are sort of as small as possible. So that's kind of the, the zero order um, uh, sort of thing for efficiency. And then the, the second thing, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in more detail right now, actually, uh, is to, to just get your, your, uh, the simulation of your quantum dynamics to get that right. Um, so, so generally, you want to use something, uh, polynomial expansions and like, you know, in, blast, uh, in place blast operations, things like that. So let me actually go into detail about that a little bit more. So, so for propagation methods, so right, so we have we have a Schrodinger equation, or in fact, if it's an open quantum system, it's you can still write it. It's the same equation, you know, up to this factor i. People, you know, sometimes put it there or not. Uh, I find it's it's useful to have the exact same equation for open and, and closed quantum systems, uh, just because then you can use the exact same methods. Um, but it's basically, you know, it's a differential equation uh, for a state, and then you have something on the right hand side um, that's basically, you know, just a like a matrix vector multiplication. Um, well, and well, one thing you can do is you can plug that into an ODE solver, uh, and that's of course Julia is, is you know very very good at that at providing you all kinds of different ODE solvers, uh, and that's probably what most people do. That's what Qtip does. Um, that's sort of a very very common approach. Uh, but probably the numerically better approach is um, to sort of know that okay, this you can formally solve, right? So this you know the solution to this differential equation is just the exponential of you know minus i h dt uh, in the piecewise constant case, but you know you can you can sort of extend it, or you can if it's piecewise constant, it's going to be you know like a, a steps propagation steps uh, where you have this kind of time evolution operator. Uh, at each one in time. And then the, the question of solving the Schrodinger equation is just uh, how do you like actually evaluate this, the, the application of this exponential to a state, how do you evaluate that efficiently? Um, and uh, sort of, I mean, there's, there's sort of uh, things like, you know, if you've, if you've seen split step um, where, you know, which is again for um, coordinate uh, representations, uh, you know, you can do you can do sort of things to evaluate the simultaneous. So that's sort of in this in this philosophy of actually evaluating the solution as opposed to just uh, you know using an ODE solver. Um, but the the sort of the I think the sort of the most efficient methods are uh, by just expanding this this exponential into some kind of polynomial series. And probably well, the most straightforward one uh, would be. Um, to use a Taylor series, which is sort of, you know, everybody sort of is familiar with that. And in fact, if you, you know, if you do a Taylor series to first order, and then you make like an adjustment to sort of guarantee that you preserve unitarity, then you get Crank Nicholson, which, you know, people use. Um, or you can also do a high, a high order Taylor series, and then usually people combine it with a, like a Kudov subspace, and then you get Arnoldi Langsos, which is also um, you know, commonly used. So this is sort of Taylor series, but in fact, you can, you, you don't have to use like Taylor polynomials. You can just use uh, any other sort of complete polynomial set. And in fact, mathematically, uh, there's this set of, of Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, and these are sort of mathematically proven to be the fastest converging polynomials. So this is actually, at least for closed quantum systems, this is a, a very uh, sort of useful uh, thing so so I I think you know people should be aware of it. so Chebyshev polynomials they're just you know they're defined in sort of a little bit of a weird way um, sort of most importantly and this is sort of a caveat to this to these uh, propagation with Chebyshev polynomials they're defined on the real axis on the interval between minus one and one um, okay and and sort of you know if you write out this definition there's there's actually a recursive definition uh, where it's basically you know you have the first two starting polynomials and then you have a recursive definition. Uh, for all the higher order polynomials. Okay, so this restriction of uh, oh yeah, and and um, so basically, so these I said already they're they're sort of the fastest converging ones. So you can compare if you do um, Taylor expansion of this you know sine two pi x uh, on the interval of minus one to one to by you know you, you're allowed to use a ninth degree polynomial. If you do it with Taylors, this is your approximation. If you do it with Chebyshev. This is your approximation. So you can sort of immediately get an, an intuition that uh, you know Chebyshev is sort of much much better, especially on the like on the boundaries, which is you know typically with polynomial expansions, uh, you have a problem that they kind of diverge on the like the the 
the limits of the uh, of the um, of the domain. Um, so that's something that uh, Trebuchet is, is very good at, right? So so if you apply this to um, quantum uh, systems, uh, so now we want to evaluate this exponential here in terms of Trebuchet polynomials. So you have you know you have a sum with coefficients, and then you have the polynomial. And the argument now instead of sort of uh, an x is now um, the the operator, right? So we have a function on the on the on the Hamiltonian. And uh, well, because the Chebyshev polynomials are only defined on the interval of minus one to one, you actually have to normalize your Hamiltonians, right? So the normalized Hamiltonian is, so you have to have some kind of estimate uh, or like an overestimate of the spectral range of your Hamiltonians. So you have to, this is kind of a caveat of this method that you somehow have to estimate your, your, your spectral range. So the minimum eigenvalue and the, the, the largest eigenvalue, and then you have, right? So here you have the range and then you have the minimum eigenvalue. So you can normalize this so that you know that the eigenvalues of this normalized Hamiltonian are in the range of minus one to one. And then you can, you know, you can use it as an argument in the, um, the Chebyshev polynomials. The other thing is that specifically for the exponential function, um, the coefficients are actually analytic. Um, so it's basically just a prefactor. And then this JK here are the, the Bessel functions, uh, which are of course tabulated. Um, so, so, you know, you can, you don't act, you can just calculate these uh, directly um, uh, sort of analytically. So that's a very nice feature. And then uh, basically if you evaluate uh, the series here, so, you know, if we, if we call the application of the, the polynomial in H to the state, if you call that sort of a state uh, phi of order n, then uh, basically there's the states of the order, um, you know, n are basically the same as the recursion relation to the Trebuchet polynomials. So you just have this recursive relationship here. And that actually also illustrates why uh, polynomial uh, propagation methods are kind of efficient uh, because you always write polynomial, when you evaluate higher order polynomials, you can always do it recursively. So, so you're basically just doing repeated application of the Hamiltonian to a state, uh, which scales much better than, right, it scales sort of n squared, as opposed to like n cubed, if you were doing sort of matrix-matrix uh, matrix, uh, multiplication, like if you were evaluating this here as an operator, uh, that would scale really terribly. Uh, if you just said, you know, XM in, 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 uh, in, in, in MATLAB or, you know, X of, a, of an operator in, in Julia, uh, that scales really badly, as opposed to sort of just doing repeated applications of uh, the Hamiltonian to the vector. And of course, also, as I said, it's, so there, that's where it's important that your operators are sparse, right? So this is gonna be a sparse matrix vector product. So that, that sort of becomes quite efficient. Um, and in terms of implementation, um, so this the nice thing about Trebuchet, it's really easy to implement. So this is the, the pseudocode, which is from my, my PhD thesis. Um, and uh, you can sort of see it's, right? So you can see here where you do the normalization and then you, you, you just sort of um, do the application of the uh, of the the uh, the uh, operator, um, like the the matrix vector uh, products, right? So it's it's really um, so A is the Hamiltonian in this case. Uh, so it's it's really it's really very straightforward. And you can see it's it's just a few lines of code. And maybe I'll, I'll show the the Julia code that implements this. You know, it just basically looks like the pseudocode uh, because Julia is sort of nice in that way. So it, it's very straightforward. And um, unfortunately, it only you know it only works for uh, the real axis, which means Hermitian Hamiltonians. Um, if you have open quantum systems, there's a significantly more complicated version of this using Newton polynomials. So I'm not going to go into that, but you know, you can you can <laughs> read on it uh, or or like ask me about it. Um, but that's you know that's a little bit more complicated. But it's the same idea of using sort of these polynomial expansions, right? Okay, so that's that's basically getting your propagation right um, and uh, you know, doing that as efficiently as possible. And now the, the sort of the last step in sort of the whole framework of quantum control is, is to do the optimum control methods. And there, I guess the sort of the main efficiency uh, uh, question is, you know, how do you do that in a way that parallelizes easily? Um, and also how do you get flexibility, right? So this is actually going to be sort of the the, the main focus on the talk is, is using automatic differentiation or something like that, or, you know, like neural networks or all kinds of these things for sort of, more advanced uh, uh, functionals, but right. so so yeah, I already mentioned uh, AD. So I, I think probably everybody like has a basic understanding of what like AD is, right? So if you don't raise your hand, maybe or something. Okay, all right. So so yeah. So the idea is basically you know you you just sort of evaluate your function and you 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 know you do a, a forward pass and a backward pass and you know you get your your um your uh, gradient sort of automatically with like a package like Zygote or, you know, people have doing this, been doing this traditionally in like TensorFlow. Um, 
and and yeah, in fact, so there there there's a bunch of papers coming out of Chicago um, that sort of do optimal control with uh, adiabatic uh, with automatic differentiation in TensorFlow. Um, so so you know, basically the idea is you can you can just sort of extend AD to all these like uh, linear algebra linear linear algebra operations that you would have in um, quantum mechanics. Right? So it's it's just sort of uh, very straightforward. Uh, and and so the benefit of that is, as I said, it's flexibility, right? So it's it basically it means you can use arbitrary functionals, um, and uh, this is just a table of the functionals that they use in that in that paper. Uh, so you know you have a, a bunch of like final time functions. You also have running costs. You can you you know you can put penalties on variations in your control field, uh, or or you know even like a forbidden subspaces. So sort of all the things, and and these you could do before, like they're they're not sort of um, weird functionals or unusual functionals. So you can do this sort of with existing methods, but it's just, you know, in this case, the convenience of uh, sort of just being able to write the, out the functional and the then you know, the computer will just sort of do the the, the simulation in within the within TensorFlow and you get the gradients automatically and then you can do optimal control by just, you know, and like feeding that into LBFGS. Um, so for me personally, oh yeah, and you can also do um, uh, sort of arbitrary equations of motions uh, like quantum trajectories as uh, so that's that's sort of another nice feature that you kind of get automatically um and also gpu support so you know if they, they were doing it in tensorflow and in their situation they can get some uh, some speed up by by simulating things on the gpu um but sort of for me personally in terms of um like being able to use arbitrary functionals there's actually sort of the the stronger case of there there's interesting functionals that are uh, sort of non-analytic, and and so the one that we looked at some some years ago was uh, so if you want to optimize for um, an entangling two qubit case, so like a C naught or a C phase, um, but you don't actually care about which one you get, right? Because because you know you can do single qubit operations, and uh, the only thing you actually need to do on a universal quantum computer is some um, some perfectly entangling quantum gate. Um, well, and it turns out that you can. You can quantify the entangling power of a gate uh, by going through the sort of mathematical uh, procedure of, of what is called the wire chamber. So every every two qubit gate has sort of these three uh, numbers: these C1, C2, C3, which are called wire chamber coordinates associated with it. So this is I don't know if you if you're familiar. This is you know, the Cartan decomposition of, of two qubit gates. Uh, so there's these these three quantities: C1, C2, C3, and uh, once you know them, you can calculate. The, the concurrence of the of the of the gate, which is the maximum, like if you put in an, a separable input state, what is the maximum concurrence of the output state, right? So so like in a C naught, you can put in a separable state, you get in a perfectly entangled state. So that that means that the, the concurrence of, of the gate is also is also one. Right. So you can you can calculate once you know the C2, C1, C2, C3, you can calculate this gate concurrence, but the C1, C2, C3, and this, you know, you, you can find the procedure in this paper. Uh, so you get that by taking your so you is your two qubit gates all right so you take your two qubit gate and then you take a like a, a bit flipped uh or yeah bit flipped version of your two qubit gate and you calculate the eigenvalues of this right and and then you do some you know you do some permutations some branch selection and then you get the c's and then you put the c's in this you know maximum of sign of all the possible combinations of the of the c1s and c3s so you can sort of see that this is this is not analytic in the sense that you can you know if you have eigenvalues you can't just sit down and by hand and write down like what is the derivative of this of this of this function um so so that kind of makes it difficult to do optimal control traditionally well and at the time so this was in, in 2015 what we did is um so 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 these c1 c2 c3 they're sort of a geometric representation and it turns out so this is sort of all the possible decubic gates are sort of in this in this geometric shape here uh, for these three coordinates, and it turns out that all the perfect entanglers are actually in this uh, compact region, at uh, this polyhedron that's sort of shaded here inside this wild chamber. And then you can sort of do a, a geometric uh, um, optimization where you just say, okay, let's calculate like where we are in the wild chamber, and let's just minimize the geometric distance to the surface of this polyhedron. And then you get something that looks, you know, a bit complicated. Uh, and it, you know it is complicated, and kind of, but it's 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 an analytic expression for the distance to this to this uh, to the surface of this polyhedron, and then at least you get something that you know is analytical, and you can take a derivative off, even though it you know it takes you like you know a month to like write out the derivative and sort of implement it without bugs, because uh, it's 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 like an, basically an eighth order polynomial. But but you know that's what we did at the time. Uh, but of course now 
um, once you sort of know that you can do AD, to the computer, everything is analytic. So including this, this, this gate concurrence is in principle something that's analytic. And um, similar is something we're doing more recently, quantum Fisher information for open quantum systems also involves sort of the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the state. So that's a similar situation where you, you sort of inherently non-analytic, but with, you know, with AD, you can do that. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, as you probably know, there's, you know, AD has sort of compromises or problems uh, mainly, and that's the thing you can't really get around is the overhead of the, the automatic differentiation uh, in terms of like, you know, storing this graph uh, storing all the the adjoints uh, in the backward propagation, and you know also computation overhead, uh, just by sort of not doing your linear algebra sort of in the like in blast sort of at the lowest level, but sort of especially in something like TensorFlow, right? So, so it gets represented in this graph. Um, then you also have framework limitations. Uh, so traditionally, uh, not all of the AD frameworks had support for complex numbers, and that's just you know because they sort of originate from machine learning where you don't sort of need these things. Um, uh, you know, like like zygote even now doesn't have in-place operations, uh, so that's that's a problem. Um, like it's early on, there were you know you didn't even have double positions. So these are all things you can work around, but it sort of you know it adds sort of complications uh, and and possibly reduces your efficiency uh, quite significantly. And then there's also the question of code reuse. So if you if you already have like a gradient descent uh, optimization, uh, maybe you know you don't want to sort of rewrite that uh, sort of completely in in TensorFlow. Uh, or, you know, but that's less of a concern, I guess, than Julia, because uh, the AD actually ties in very nicely with using sort of the standard, uh, the standard um, linear algebra things. But that's that's sort of the, the compromises. And uh, well, the, the message uh, sort of, of the talk is kind of, there, there's a way that you don't have to compromise. And this is something that we call uh, semi-automatic differentiation. This is, this is sort of the 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 paper that I'll I'll go into um so this you know we this uh, appeared on the archive uh, I guess a little while ago um so so there the the idea is okay how do how can you actually do uh, sort of get all the power of AD without sort of any of the the overhead uh, so I'm going to switch to sort of a a, a whiteboard um, uh, sort of mode for this okay um. Okay, so so let's just remember what what sort of the functional is that we're trying to optimize, right? So we have a functional that's uh, directly a functional of all the control field values, and this is the final time functional that depends explicitly on the forward propagated states. Um, so we have you know we have like a the the different the different basis states uh, for the Q two qubit gate, and then we also have you know running costs, but the running costs are a little bit more complicated, so that's that's you know you have to look at the paper sort of for that sort of thing. And uh, well, now what we want to calculate is the gradient of this functional, which is just the derivative of um, j uh, with respect or jt because we're only dealing with jt with respect to the control field values, right? Um, okay, so now let's let's take seriously uh, what I wrote here that the the states uh, that the the, the final time function explicitly depends on the forward propagated states, and that means we can do we can do a chain rule, right? So we can just write uh, the derivative of J T with respect to the control field is going to be the derivative of J T with respect to the states psi k of t times the derivative of the state. Uh, with respect to the field. And of course, we have a bunch of states uh, that we're looking at, so all the different basis states. And then also we have to take into account that um, uh, this here is a, um, so the, 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 the state is a, uh, a complex quantity. Uh, so we're gonna have to do something, you know, called the, uh, a working a derivative, which just gives us uh, an additional two times real part that we don't really have to worry about. Um, Right, and then the other thing we have to we sort of have to deal with is that this is the derivative here of a scalar with respect to a vector. So you, you kind of have to do matrix calculus, and uh, so right. So cat traditionally is a, is a column vector. Uh, so matrix calculus will tell you that this should be a, a row vector, which in quantum mechanics would be a, a bra. So we just sort of you know take this thing and define it as chi k of t. So just sort of introduce a new name. And of course, right, so chi k of t is going to be 
just the derivative of the functional with respect to the propagated co-state. Um, psi t. Okay, all right, so that's that's that. And then we have uh, two times the real part of um, the sum over k. Okay, so so what we can do now is we can realize that um, this this state of chi k here does not explicitly depend on the control field values. So we just push that into the, root, the derivative and we'll have, so we'll have the derivative first. So we have d, uh, over d epsilon nl, and then we have the overlap of chi k of t of psi k of t. And that's that's already kind of the important uh, sort of insight is just to do this chain rule. So this chain rule uh, sort of will allow you to sort of very efficiently um, 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 evaluate this because now what we have as sort of the, the key part is there's just the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, <coughs> the gradient of an overlap between two condom states. And that's in fact already what you have uh, sort of in traditional grape. It's just that the chi now, you know, becomes is, is defined by this boundary condition. Okay, so, so now in, in the specific case, now where you have uh, piecewise constant controls, um, we can sort of write this out uh, sort of more, uh, more sort of in more detail. So then we're going to have the derivative of uh, this overlap is going to be chi k t. And now I'm just going to write out the time evolution sort of as a as a product of time evolution operators. So right, so you have n time steps. You have u up to u uh, one of the uh, state at time zero. All right, so u is just for each time step is going to be e to the minus i h uh, for the particular time step dt. Okay, and now this is going to be uh, the chi k of t, and we're going to have the time evolution operators, and then so so we're only caring about the the derivative specifically at some specific point time point uh, sort of n. So we're going to have u n plus one. And then we're going to have the one that we actually care about. So this is the one where we want to evaluate the derivative epsilon and L. And then you have un minus one all the way up to u1 uh, of the initial state. Uh, and this already sort of gives you now a, a sort of a numerical scheme because you can see that this here is basically a forward propagation of the initial state. This here is going to be a backward propagation of this this boundary condition state here, and then the only thing we we sort of have to worry about after that is this how to evaluate this um, this derivative here. That's sort of the local derivative for that particular time step. Um, right. So so um, so that's that's basically. It. And now the the sort of the, the the main thing is that the only thing where the functional actually enters the entire optimization is in calculating this boundary condition. Uh, for chi, right? So chi, you, you just have to evaluate it as uh, the derivative of the functional with respect to the states. And uh, well, this you can do it with AD uh, sort of very easily. Uh, or if you think that maybe your Hilbert space is, is too large, um, uh, then you can you can actually still further analytically simplify this. So let's say you have a functional that depends on the the quantum gate. So like in the case for the 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 perfect entangler. Uh, let's say you have a, a, a four by four matrix. So um, let's say you have you know a functional JT of A, where A is now my complex four by four matrix. Well, then we know that A is is just uh, the the projection of your propagated state onto um, onto onto a basis of phi i. So that's just so this is going to be the the uh, i k. Uh, component of this of this you know four by four matrix, uh, and then well you can do you can sort of do another chain rule, uh, and you you know you sort of immediately see that the derivative of the functional with respect to the state uh, is just going to be the sum i over d j t over d u i k, and then you know. Uh, sort of basically into the in the basis vectors of your your um, your two qubit gates, um, right? And this is now something. So now this is sort of what you plug into the AD, and that's that's a very trivial function, right? So that's just a function of basically sixteen 
uh, different numbers. So no matter what your JT is, even if it's like weird and complicated, you can definitely plug that into an AD framework and and uh, you know get it uh, like forward mode or the backward mode or whatever. Uh, you can you can sort of do that efficiently for any kind of function. And the overhead of that is going to be very, very negligible compared to the whole propagation, right? So the propagation just sort of completely dominates that. Um, so that, that's the basic idea. So basically just by doing the chain rule in the states, you sort of get this general scheme where for the function only enters in the boundary condition of this backward propagation. And this boundary condition, you can evaluate sort of very efficiently uh, within, an, within an AD framework. Right. Um, okay. So let's go back. So, so the one thing that's sort of uh, still open is how to evaluate that. And for that, there's a, uh, a, a sort of a, a somewhat known trick at this point. Um, um, that's sort of, I don't know, you guys know it, but <laughs> if you don't, you should, because this is actually a, a, a way to evaluate um, sort of derivatives um, or, or gradients that's sort of extremely efficient um, for, for like the time evolution operators. Uh, so basically there's a way where you, you take the state that you want to propagate, you pad it with zero. So you do like an extended state and you define sort of an extended, uh, an extended Hamiltonian that has the original Hamiltonian on the diagonal. So this is just the, um, you know, this N is just the, the time slice. So this is the full Hamiltonian for that time slice. And then you put in the right column, you put the um, the derivative of your um, of your Hamiltonian with respect to to that particular control field. So you know if you have two controls, this is just you know like a three, uh, I guess a three by three matrix. Uh, so it's just like an extended an extended Hamiltonian. And if you if you um, do the time propagation of this extended uh, sort of object, then you get something on the left hand side here that is well. First of all, you get the, the actual propagation of the state that you want to propagate, but you also get the the um, the application of the uh, derivative of the time evolution operator with respect to that uh, with respect to that control also applied to the state. So you sort of get them both at the same time. So this is kind of I think this is this is kind of forward propagation uh, in terms of like AD. So it's kind of a manual uh, forward mode uh, kind of automatic differentiation, very similar to like dual numbers. Uh, but it's it's a very useful trick, and it that's basically what you use. To calculate the uh, that sort of the 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 one step where you calculate the, the like the local time evolution operator derivative, but you can actually also extend this. So this 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 equation actually holds also for um, time continuous fields. So you can if you have some kind of parameter, um, you can sort of do the entire propagation just with this, and then you get also you get the derivative with respect to the parameter. So there's actually uh, you know there's an optimization method called GOAT. Which sort of just does this basically uh, with with continuous pulses. Um, so so that this is actually a, a very useful thing. And well, with that you sort of get a complete um, sort of uh, semi AD enhanced uh, kind of grape scheme. Uh, so what you actually do in, in sort of in terms of the numerics is you take your 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 basis state. So this is sort of just one of them, but you know you do this sort of in parallel. Um, so you take your basis state, you propagate it forward, you store all of these propagated states. And then you do your boundary condition. So this is right. So you, from this state, you plug that into AD. You get this boundary condition for this this uh, chi k, and you also do the the extension into what I just showed. Like you pad it with zeros, and you 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 pad your Hamiltonian uh, sort of in this in this block structure. Uh, so you get the boundary condition here, and then you do a backward propagation uh, in this. You know, using these extended states and extended propagators. Uh, and at each point in time, now this is going to give you like a component of the gradient of the overlap. Uh, so tau is just the the overlap of uh, of chi with with psi. So that's sort of the thing we're interested in. So for every time set, now you get the, the component of the gradient, and then at the very end, uh, you, to get the the gradient of your your total functional, uh, you just sort of basically uh, you know take the 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 average for the different uh, for the different uh, states um, so for the different basis states. So you just take a sum over k, and that gives you the gradient. And this is completely general, right? So so this works. Uh, the same scheme works for absolutely any kind of of um, a functional. Okay, so so as I said, so traditionally uh, we've sort of implemented all of these like the propagation methods and the, the sort of the various control methods uh, in in Fortran. So there's this this uh, Fortran library uh, that I was sort of heavily involved with uh, during my PhD and that's sort of still being developed. It's it's kind of like not really open source in the sense that it's open source if you like collaborate with my you know, with my advisor, uh, but it's it's like not on GitHub or anything. Um, so it's, it's sort of a little open but private uh, source, I guess. Um, 
And we also did at some point an implementation of um, not directly the, the gradient, the grape method, but there's there's a very related method uh, called Kartoff's method, which is so sort of specifically designed for near continuous uh, fields. So it's still piecewise constant, but sort of the assumption is that it's it's sort of you know the piecewise continuous piecewise constant limit of a continuous function. There, there's sort of a, a slightly more trickier uh, optimization uh, uh, method called Kartoff. So we we did implement that in Python as well. Uh, and that that it's very nice for sort of setting things up and sort of playing around and for like students, but it doesn't sort of, you know, Python sort of, we ran into sort of problems with with uh, efficiency and with, especially with parallelization, that's sort of uh, uh, kind of our dead end if you really want to use this for like, you know, very large hybrid spaces, uh, very big systems. Um, so, so basically, um, to sort of get the flexibility of AD and sort of also the flexibility of sort of easily being able to apply this to different uh, methods, uh, I, I sort of started to, to sort of re-implement some of these things, or actually, you know, first, this is the first implementation of this sort of semi-AD concept um, to do it in Julia. Uh, well, and, and that's probably where I should sort of uh, switch a little to, um, to sort of like a demo mode. So, so right, so so there's this uh, Julia quantum control organization that sort of contains a bunch of, of packages that sort of are very tightly coupled. Um, so the the quantum propagators that implements things like the uh, like the the Chebyshev that I just uh, explained, or the Newton uh, for for open quantum systems, and potentially also you know other other propagation methods. So this is kind of the 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 back end for doing the simulation. Um, and then you have um, you know, you have a base package that sort of collects sort of all the 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 things that sort of uh, are sort of not specific to a specific uh, optimization method, and then you have uh, packages for the the specific uh, um, um, optimization uh, methods. So so you know, so the grape that is basically the scheme that I just showed, and the Kortov, which is uh, which is sort of the very related uh, but but slightly separate scheme. And you know, the future will will you know will extend this with things like like crab or, or goat or you know other kinds of optimizers potentially. But these are sort of the two the two big ones that are you know gradient based optimizers that sort of are traditionally used. But both of these are um, at least approximately piecewise constants. So that's that's kind of this kind of the thing. Um, well, then everything is packaged together in this quantum control.jl. So as a user, this is the only package you would you would install. You would just say add you know quantum control.jl, and uh, basically it gives you all the the other packages. So so as a user, this is kind of the the front end uh, package. Um, right. Um, so there's there's that that also means there's like a single. Uh, um, um, well, there, there's sort of a coherent uh, documentation that's sort of intended to cover more or less all of them, and then you know link out like the the propagation package sort of has its own documentation. But all of these are are very much they're not really uh, written out yet, so they're they're still they're still in heavy development. But in principle, you know you can you can sort of look at this, and this this should explain sort of what the philosophy is, uh, sort of how to like what the basic concepts are. I think the basic concepts is better if, if I go through sort of an example uh, to illustrate those. Um, but but yeah, but that's that's sort of uh, that's sort of there, and uh, well yeah. So so why don't I go um, through an example of? Did I lose my example. There we go. Oh, there's my example. Okay. So this is this is uh, this is an example that is uh, it's one of the examples in the documentation, but I, I updated it a little last night to to sort of be a little bit more. Uh, so this is this is not online yet, but uh, it, you know it will be at some point soonish. Um, all right. So this is sort of how you actually set up uh, an optimization for uh, an entanglement gate for for a couple of transmon qubits. So that's the system that I was showing at the very beginning. Um, all right. So so basically, okay. So you just set it up. Uh, so it's sort of very nicely in Julia that you can sort of write your Hamiltonian sort of in a you know a very mathematical way. So you just you know just write out. So there's the anharmonic oscillator, uh, right? So you have anharmonic terms here. Well, this is the harmonic part. This is the anharmonic part, and then you have the the static coupling between you know the 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 um, the bosonic operators of the two the two qubits, and then you have your drive. And uh, well, in this case, so we're doing this in a rotating frame, right? So in principle, you can have complex valued uh, control fields, which would correspond to um, deviating from the the frequency of your of your rotating frame. Um, so so we basically just split that up into like a real and imaginary part as two independent control pulses. So you got you got two control pulses here that correspond to one 
sort of complex valued physical pulse, which you know corresponds to sort of a variable frequency pulse in in, in the lab. Um, so that's that. So, so you just set up your Hamiltonian as your drift Hamiltonian, and then the the control Hamiltonians with the the control feed. And this is sort of um, so you can set up your your sort of your your generate. So this is basically the time dependent Hamiltonian, right? So you can you can set that up any way you want. So you can have your, like, your own data structures for time dependent Hamiltonian. But sort of the default is this sort of a nested tuple thing that I basically is inspired by QTIP uh, because they use this sort of nested nested uh, tuple sort of format for time dependent Hamiltonian. So I'm I'm just using that here as well. All right. So you, you you can set up your control field. So we have a bunch of sort of you know like shapes in the, in this library that you can use. So you just sort of so, sort of set that up to have like a smooth control field. And yeah, we can so we can plot this. So this is the initial control field. So it's just something you know that switches on smoothly, then stays on for a certain period of time. And uh, you know initially we're going to be it's going to be uh, just the real part. So the the imaginary part is zero. So the face is is zero. All right. So we define the basis. So again, something that's very nicely done in. In Julia, so you define your two qubit bases, uh, very straightforward. You have your, you know, you have the four states that define the the qubit gate. And now, for, if you want to do sort of a direct uh, gate optimization, you would, um, you would, you know, let's say we want to do a square root of of i swap. So this is your square root of i swap. Um, so you basically just take all of your target states out of your basis states, and you just get for each basis state you get a target state by just applying the square root of i swap to it. And then, and this is kind of the sort of one of the the key philosophies. So basically, when we define the the optimization, we just define a, a list of uh, objectives, and uh, basically we treat each state that we look at, uh, so each each basis state in this case, we treat it as an as an independent. Uh, kind of uh, optimization objective, and this this is basically to enable parallelization because all of these things so you can run these in parallel, right? So you can look at look at each basis state, um, you can look at each basis state, um, and uh, sort of look at at what the what the dynamics are, uh, and uh, so this so we always set up the objectives as a list of the sort of this objective that's sort of initial state target state, and then the dynamic generator, right? Um, so we can look at how that behaves for the, the guest field. So this is just the sort of the constant pulse. So you just, uh, you know, you use these uh, propagate objectives, which is, you know, part of the library. So you get the states that result from, from this propagating the, the initial field. Uh, you translate that into a, into a two qubit gate. So just sort of the four by four matrix by projecting. Um, and then, okay, so if you do, uh, the the square modulus functional, uh, you know, you can see that the, the gate error for the guess is, is like ninety one percent error. So this is you know corresponds to one minus the trace of of u dagger we use the gate that we get with the square root of i swap uh, uh, sort of squared and like the trace. You know, it's just the you know, square square modulus of the overlaps. Okay, so now to optimize you, so if you you take these objectives and you you have to add a few more things. Like you have to add specifically the functional and you know some values of like when to stop, what the time grid is, and you know like convergence sort of checkers, like whatever you want. You can you can just put in a condition of like when you want the optimization to stop. And once you have that, you just run this this optimization uh, function, and that just sort of goes ahead and and does exactly the the numerical procedure that I had before. Uh, sort of, you know, going going backward and forward, uh, and yeah, you know, well, you can see that it sort of converges very nicely from sort of a gate error of like ninety one percent to a gate error of ten to the minus four, um, because that's the the stopping condition. Uh, well, and then you know what you get out is um, is a pulse that sort of looks like this. So it's not from a physical perspective. You know, I'm, I'm not really that interested in sort of specifically what what's going on here in this in this case. But you get some kind of you know auto control pulse. Uh, you can propagate that pulse. You'll see that uh, you know you can verify that you get uh, like a nine, like four nines or whatever um, in the fidelity. And and similarly, if you have a perfect entangler, as this was the the example that I was showing before, so now you can do this. You know, you can do this with with the AD. And this is really so. This is done analytically here. Uh, with an analytic gradient, but but the, the perfect entangler and specifically the um, the the like the direct optimization for the gate concurrence, which is actually below here. Um, so this is right. So this is sort of everything I just explained. So we, we just do these boundary conditions via uh, AD, and uh, well, it you know it works. It actually it converges much faster than the direct optimization because we have more uh, sort of freedom in going to sort of an arbitrary perfect entangler. But this you know it, it like it totally. So the only thing you tell it is the actual functional. Uh, so the, you know, the 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 concurrence function, and you don't tell it the gradient. So the, we put here gradient via chi. So this tells it to sort of use this. Uh, 
this trick of like how do you calculate the, you know to use the ad basically to calculate the gradient automatically well and you get a result and and basically you're happy so that's that's kind of the demo of uh, of of how this works and uh well just to conclude i should you know with, with sort of this new method of semi id so the promise was that it completely eliminates the overhead of um of um uh, sort of doing full ad which would mean just you know propagating everything in an ad framework uh, and this is sort of the benchmarks on the paper uh so we're basically comparing the the, the blue thing or uh, is the the semi id and we're comparing that with the direct optimization that's the first thing i just showed where you just sort of directly optimize for a gate with a with a completely analytic gradient so there's no ad in this and this is sort of the semi id and we're comparing that with sort of doing um full ad either with a generic ode solver so like you know it's, it's just the the differential equation such l or a re-implementation of chebyshev in in zygote uh, where we sort of just avoid in place operations so we just you know but it's it's simple enough that you can do that uh, for chebyshev and well you can see to see that so first thing you see is with the semi id it completely matches the direct optimization so it's, it's basically the overhead is, is not measurable so there's like basically zero id overhead and if you compare it to well you know either like basically, if you if you use full AD, either you you sort of it's slow or it's like memory uh, sort of uh, it requires sort of excessive memory. Uh, so I guess somehow the differential equations it's it's pretty slow. It's actually very slow, but but it's it's somehow it uh, sort of you know it's it's AD aware like it's aware of Zygo. So it does like its own sort of efficient memory handling. I guess so the the memory overhead is sort of a constant. Uh, it's still pretty significant, but it's you know it doesn't scale badly. Uh, but then so so yeah, so either the runtime goes up, or if we do it with Chebyshev, then you have this problem of you know it's like the full computational graph. So you have the the overhead of the the reverse mode uh, sort of memory requirements. So that sort of goes up. I mean not exponentially in the mathematical sense, but you know like basically prohibitively. Uh, so this is you know this is still mo very moderate Hilbert space sizes. Um, so you, you sort of if you do full AD, you just sort of run out. Of resources very quickly, whereas with this, um, it's it's still ultimately uh, these things. So the the both the RAM and the runtime, they they do scale linearly, but just because you have to store the states, um, so that's sort of you know inherent. So you you know you still like you still have to be able to simulate your system. Uh, like if your Hilbert space is is you know exponentially large, and at some point you just can't simulate it anymore, then you know there's nothing you can do. But it's basically if you can simulate it, you can optimize it, uh, and and you know with this MID. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it in terms of what I had uh, prepared in that uh, talk. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for the very wonderful talk. And so I will stop recording now. Sure. Mm.